everybody. I want to welcome you back to another uh, Thursday night fly tying event here at Caribou Craft Brewery uh, here with Fly Fishing Bow Rivers. Uh, my name is Tim Hepworth. We're going to take you through a couple of flies again tonight. We're going to start off with a few announcements for you back home as well as you guys here. Um, we want to talk about a few things we kind of have coming up in the next few weeks and months. Um, First thing we want to talk about, on March 28th, we're doing um, the IF4 Film Festival. We're bringing a, a, that event down to Red Deer. So if you haven't already seen it, if you missed it when it was in town and you want to go down and check it out, um, you guys are more than welcome. You can, uh, you can book your tickets online. Uh, you also can get them through West River Fly Shop in Red Deer, so Troy's place. Um, but yeah, probably the easiest way is to go on, online to their website and pick one up. So if you guys want to come on down to Red Deer, uh, that's March 28th. Um, also, we have coming up, in June, we just kind of finalized this whole whole process, but uh, Fly Fishing Bow River is actually doing a guide school again um, this year. So last year was kind of a beta test year, and this year kind of running a full one. So if you know anybody or you're interested yourself and you're kind of curious as to what the, the guiding industry looks like, um, or if you're curious, you know someone who might want to get into it, um, let us know. We uh, we'll work with some people to see if we can we're filling up pretty quick though, so if you're, if you're interested though, get, get on top of it quickly. So what that's gonna look like is we're gonna do uh, six days. Um, it'll be a 60 plus hour um, course, just two different weekends. So we try to keep it, you know, we'll keep it on the Friday, Saturday, Sunday so that most people don't have to take a lot of time off work. Um, so if you're interested in that, for sure let us know. Um, it is gonna be the first two weekends of June and hopefully the weather cooperates. We might, we might have runoff, we might not. We're hoping we don't, but um, we also don't want to be in the in the ice and snow either, and want to be able to catch fish. So, um, also guided trips for this summer. If you guys are interested, um, let us know. Dates are actually booking up quick now. People are kind of getting anxious to be out on the water. So a lot of the peak seasons, our peak season would be August, September. Those are booking pretty fast. So if you're interested in a trip and you want to take along with us and let us take you somewhere, um, either floats on the bow or up in the mountains, whatever you prefer, let us know. We can get going on that. All right, I think that's all I have as far as announcements for today. So we're sticking with our, our, mountain, our mountain month again this week. So last week we did a green drake pattern and um, what was our second pattern? It's been a week ago already. Oh, the Fat Albert, right, yeah. So our foam, our foam hopper pattern. So this week we're gonna do a, a couple more mountain flies. So we're gonna do a bull trout streamer um, and we're also gonna do this little guy here. So a little beetle. Um, this one is I mean, a beetle's a beetle. We just find this one to be really effective. It's uh, our own kind of, not our own pattern, but one that we've used and really, really like. A little bit different style of tying it. Very simple fly, but very effective. And one you can get tie up lots of, and it'll save you a lot of money if you can tie this one, so. All uh, right, well, let's get started. We're gonna start with the beetle pattern. So in your packages, um, all the materials for the beetle are in the little package inside the bigger package, okay? So we're gonna be tying this on a size 14 uh, dry fly hook. These could be tied. These could be tied even smaller, maybe down to a 16, or they could be tied bigger. Um, a lot of our, like this, this specific bug here, we're gonna get uh, a good profile on the water, and it might look to them like a beetle. We call it a beetle. It might be an ant. It could be anything, right? Could be that a bigger ant or a smaller beetle. Just kind of be, seems to be a good kind of crossover pattern that covers both things. So I like the 14 and the 16. That's the sizes I fish most. Um, sometimes you tie them, you know, even down to a 10, and they're they're a lot larger because we do have some big beetles. I'm not sure how often those ones get in the water either, but um, yeah. So let's get going. So let's get our our hook set in our vise. A nice and small one to start to get your eyes working. Um, today I'm going to use a, um, a black UTC 140. Um, the foam that, that we're going to use for this fly today, we're using a 1 mil. It could be tied with a 2 mil foam as well. The only fear of using um, like a 70 denier is that we might cut through the foam when we're, when we're tying. So I like to use a little bit heavier one. We're not putting a ton of wraps in this fly, so we don't really need to worry about filling up the hook too fast. So a 140 is not the worst idea. So let's go ahead, let's get our, uh, our thread started on our hook. We'll start right behind the eye, and let's work a nice base all the way back to the hook bend. We can get rid of that tag. And then we'll go ahead and we'll work that thread back forward. We'll leave about two hook lengths, or sorry, two eye lengths behind the eye, and that's where we're gonna leave it for now. So 
So in your package, you're going to have uh, a foam strip. And it should, be, it should be definitely long enough to do two of these flies. So I've just taken this and I've cut it pretty rough. As you guys can see, this one either isn't totally straight. Um, what we're kind of gauging this off of is again our hook gap. So this will be, this one's a touch wide. I want it to be about hook gap and width. So if you want to trim yours down just a, a tad to get to that if you need to, go ahead and do that. If it's a little bigger, it's not the end of the world, but it's just a nice way of gauging it on every fly you tie. If you have something to gauge it off of, you know they're gonna be consistent. So if something is working, you know what fly it is and you know how to go back and retie it again. Once you got the, the width that you want, we're gonna tie this in. So I want you to go down and just cut a little, little wedge in it or a little uh, point in it. So just nick off, nip off the corners. So you're left with that little arrow. And we're gonna take that guys and what we wanna do is keep that right on top of the hook as we tie it down. And the other piece of this is, um, like for instance last week with the Fat Albert, when we tied the foam in, we were just like, we cranked down on the foam, we compressed as much as we can. Um, we don't use a lot of foam in this fly and we like to keep as much floatability as possible. So we're not gonna do a thousand wraps and get it really tight. Once I get it tied in at the tip, I'm gonna do kind of more open spiraled wraps back to the hook bend. And then when we fold it back over, over our peacock curl, we got more buoyancy built up in the foam that's in there, okay? So I'm gonna start, if you bring it, if you bring the foam towards yourself when you do your first wrap, gather it, it's gonna pull it up on top of the hook for you. Just make sure that tip is tied in nicely. And as we go back, we're just doing bigger open spirals back to the hook bend. Maybe one more in there. We just don't have to worry about compressing it down too hard. Guys, if you can't hear me at any point, it's a little bit louder in here today, they're a little busier, just let me know, I can speak up a little louder for you, okay? Also, slow me down if you need me to, put your hand up and just say, give me a second, I need to catch up. It's no problem at all. We want you guys to be able to stick with us as best as possible, okay? Okay, what I need you to grab out of your bag next is we're gonna grab the peacock curl that's in there. So you should have probably four strands in each one. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna grab two of them. So again, as we, did, as we talked about last week, this, uh, this material, they can be really brittle at the tips, so we're just gonna take those tips and, and break them off and set them aside. Now we're gonna tie these right in at the at back at the at the hook bend where we finish with our thread. We'll take a gathering wrap and get them locked in there, and then we're gonna wind those forward, which we can do together here in a second. So let's just get them tied in. Peacock curl have a way of being very fragile, even once you've tied them in. So just you're not really reefing on them as you uh, as you draw them forward. Okay. So once you tie those in, you can bring your thread up to about where you tied in. So we want to be about a hook, or, or sorry, uh, eye length behind the eye where we leave our bobbin. If you've never fished a beetle before, especially kind of in our in our areas in the mountains. Um, you'll find it's a, gr a really great searching pattern for, for these fish. So a lot of times if, you're, if a hatch isn't happening and you're like, man, I don't know what to fish, you, you've kind of tried a lot of different dry flies, the terrestrials are a really good go-to. These, you know, they might be looking very particularly at a specific dry fly and deny it. Whereas if you put on, you know, maybe a flying ant or an ant or a beetle pattern like this, they might be intrigued to bite and they do, a, they actually are very, they're attracted to it. They see a lot of them in the water and they eat a lot of them. So, a lot of times if we're struggling, and I won't even deny it, I won't go to a bug, or I won't go to a dry fly first. I will go to this, because this is, this is a really effective bug. Um, the issue with it is, is it's hard to see. So especially for clients, when we're guiding, it can be a, more of a frustrating experience for them, and it's more a, it's, it got eaten, set the hook kind of situation. So that's why we tie, the end we'll tie a little bit of an indicator in it so you can better see it. Um, another trick is though to fish it behind a dry fly. So fish it as a tandem dry fly. So if you see a fish eat anywhere near your bigger dry fly, you know it's on, you set the hook. Okay? 
Okay, let's take those, uh, those peacock curls. And you gotta kinda manage around your hook because if you hook them on there and pull, they will break, okay? So we wanna do nice, close, touching wraps with both of them together. Just kinda gotta maneuver around that hook until you're past it. And this is just gonna give a nice little sheen color to the bottom of a beetle. If you ever flipped a beetle over, it looks a lot like what this peacock curl imitates. And we just want to kind of build up a nice little bit of a round body that's going to sit underneath our foam. So one more. And then gathering wrap with our thread. Make sure it's locked in. Do another wrap behind it, a couple in front of it. And you can snip them out. We'll let you guys catch up here quick. And kind of depending on the look that you want, you could also add one or two more peacock curls and you just get a little bit bulkier looking body. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But I, in my experience, I really like a very small profile bug because it can very much imitate an ant then, so it's a lot smaller. Okay, so from there, We've got that foam in there. Now what we want to do is we want to pull it back over top. So we're not reefing on it, but we're just pulling it snug until we kind of feel it make contact with the top of the, um, with the, top of the peacock curl. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a wrap over top and we can just let our bobbin hang for a second there. What we want to do is go in there with our fingers and make sure that that foam is oriented right on top of the hook and we can pinch it with our finger and then pull down on our bobbin and it locks in on top. Take a couple more wraps to secure. Make sure it's locked in right there. So at this point, we've left that foam on there. All we've done is lock that down. And it gives us a minute here to put in our other pieces. So once you're done that, let's grab our, you're gonna see one piece of uh, black crystal flash that you have in your, in your bag. So what I want you to do with that is I want you to take it, fold it in half and cut it and then fold it in half again and cut it one more time. So you're gonna be left with four pieces. Now this little piece of, uh, this little piece of material here, I, f I think this is the biggest game changer on this pattern is that you use crystal flash for legs instead of um, you know, rubber legs or round legs or other things to imitate those legs. Um, this is just such a slim profile when it's tied in it, it just looks a lot more real. It looks very thin. Um, a way more realistic look than a rubber leg. Because a rubber leg creates that, yes, there's legs there, but they're so big in comparison to that small bug that it doesn't, uh, doesn't look perfect. Hey, yeah? No crystal flash. No crystal flash? All right, we can fix that. There, behind you there. No, I just want to pass it down. Sorry, guys. I won't lie, I package those, and they're hard to see, so I might have got missed. Yeah. Hey, maybe it fell out of the package and you and you unloaded it. I don't know. I won't take all the blame. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's a good point. When you tie with those small materials, it's nice to have like a post-it note or something. You just shove a little piece in there. <clears throat> okay. So what we're going to start with here no, I've lost mine too. There we go. So you're going to take one of those smaller pieces. So you, so you should have four pieces. What we're going to do is we're going to tie a leg in on either side of this. So we don't want to do it with too many wraps because we don't want to get too bulky up here at the head. So we'll gather a wrap on that one. We'll kind of orientate those legs so they're even. We'll take one more wrap just so they don't move on us. So no more than two wraps on each of these until we get them tied in and then we can maneuver them around to where we want them after. So with these legs, what we kind of want to do though is we don't want them to sit up too high on that foam. So we want to almost pull them down a little bit so they're just off the edge of the foam and they almost want to tip down the body of the fly. And so hopefully these are actually going to sit under the water a little bit versus uh, riding higher like we would on a hopper or something like that. 
So just try to make sure they're not up high on that foam because you can see where the thread wraps are. You could pull them up to the top or you could pull them around to the bottom. We just want it to be about halfway. Okay. So this next part is solely for us so that we can hopefully see this bug. Um, you could use, a, a lot of people tie this pattern with just a tiny little piece of orange foam, which is just as, just as good. I, I personally prefer the, the parapost or a piece of yarn that's, that's, uh, that's orange. It's just, I find it easier to see. It sticks out a little better. And either orange or pink are good colors to go with. So you should have a piece of this orange parapost in your package there. If you take it and cut it in half, because we use very, very little of this actually, all I want you to do is to split it in half, or to hold it so it's evenly front and back. Take a gathering wrap right on top of the fly. Arra arrange it so we make sure it's right on top. We'll take a couple more wraps to make sure it's secured. Then I want you to pull it, pull it rearwards. Take one more wrap kind of in front of it, maybe two. And then what we want to do is we want to pull that foam back out of the way, move our thread ahead right to behind the eye, and we're just going to make sure we've covered up all of the hooks so it looks black behind the eye, and then we're going to whip finish it right there. So pass that thread in front of the foam. How are we doing? So we're going to put it right on top. Yep, so put like half and half so it's, yep, perfect. I'm just going to put a couple of wraps over top of it and you want to keep it right right on top if you can kind of in between those legs so if your legs have moved too much on you so with our legs here what we want to do is we kind of want to I got one low down there oh right there okay so this one is attached to there yeah this one's pulled out so let's this good okay so now what we want to do is we want to tie that right in on top and you see how you have this leg right here just want to keep that out of the way yeah just the best you can trying to keep it oriented on top of the hook good and then we're going to pass our thread forward so if we've crowded our eye just a little bit, we just want to get that thread now right, right on behind the eye. And that's where we'll whip finish it, guys. We'll whip finish right behind the fly there. Or right behind the eye, sorry. And if you got some, uh, I wouldn't recommend using super glue, but if you got a head cement or a Sally Hansen's or something like that, just put, it, put a drop on, the, on those thread wraps. without cutting your legs, because that'd be a real bummer. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. So when, how we want to trim this foam, guys, is we want to, well, let's start with our post here. So this post, we want it to be very, very short. So all we want to give is just a tiniest bit of orange visible, okay? So we really don't get much out of it. Only that much, so it kind of splits it. So you're cutting pretty tight. That's why we need to make sure we had a couple of good thread wraps so it wasn't going anywhere on us. And then when I'm cutting this foam, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring my scissors up, and I'll pull this up so you can see what I'm doing here first. As I touch the hook eye with my scissors, when I come underneath that foam, so the foam's laying back down this way, I'm touching that eye, I'm just gonna trim it right there. So what that leaves for a head is a little bit of a a squared off head there and all I'm going to do is go in there and cut off the corners of the head so it rounds it a little bit. That orange fiber is kind of covering up that head for you. it's tough to see but once you've squared off the head just cut off the corner so it rounds it or if you got enough room just do a little bit of a rounded cut so it's not so boxy looking. And then all that's left is to trim our legs. And so everybody has their own personal preference on, on the length of the legs. 
On this bug, I don't think we're being um, super, super realistic with the legs as it is just because of the placement. But I, what I kind of like to do is, I'll flip it up for you so you can see here. I'm gonna pull them tight and I'm gonna give myself about there. So I would say uh, just shy of the overall length of the fly is where I'm gonna trim those off. Just like so. And that way, if you get on the river and you think they're a little long, it's easy enough to take your nippers or whatever it is and just trim them a little shorter. So when you're done, you got that nice hurl underbody. It kind of gives it a nice sheen in the water. This bug is gonna float. Um, it's not gonna float super high in the water with the one mil foam, whereas if we use a two mil foam, it would float a little higher. So it might be tough to see, but really good bug to fish. Any questions on that, guys? Good? Lost camera one. I don't think that the fish see that, po that post at all. It's more for you. So, like, everybody can has their preference. I think white is really hard to see, especially in water that's, um, if it's like, you know, a pool, for instance, you're casting up into the riffles, it disappears in there so easy. I find, personally for myself, orange is great. Um, but pink is a really good color as well. Pink is easy to see. A lot of dry flies, they put a pink post in now, and I like that as well. Um, I think orange is just contrasts the water a lot more than any other color. So my personal preference is to go orange. For you guys at home, if you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to ask as we're going along. Um, Dana can let me know what the question is, and we can, we can get it answered for you if he, if he doesn't have one already for you, okay? Are you awake, Jill? <laughs> you look tired. <laughs> yeah. Long week. It's not even the end of the week yet. Barely over the hump. Time change. Time change. It's only one hour. <laughs> so you can imagine, guys, if we step down one size smaller, it obviously is going to get even tougher to, to tie. But working at a, I think a 14 is a really it's probably one of the more popular dry fly sizes for any like atoms or anything like that. And it's, it's a good size to tie this, this beetle on, so. Okay, we can move on to our next bug. So if you moved all those materials aside, we'll move on to our streamer. This is the butt monkey. So this is a, Kelly, Kelly Gallup has lots of very interesting names for his flies. <laughs> But this one is called the butt monkey. So in our earlier weeks, I think it was like week two, we, we tied uh, the sex dungeon, which is a Kelly, Dal Kelly Gallup fly as well. And that one, we for the head, we utilized deer hair. So we tied, we spun deer hair on, we shaved it down with a razor. Um, this fly that we're tying tonight, a little bit different materials. We're using rabbit zonker strips. Um, at the end, we're gonna basically tie in sheep's wool or like a sculpin wool is what, it's, what we're actually using. So called a sculpin wool um, and what we're going to do with that is we're going to build the same style of head out of it and then we're going to use scissors instead to trim it um, so most of the most of the wool we put on we're actually going to take off we're going to cut off and make a mess but um, it's just another it's another cool material to use um, you, a lot of people are doing it with like different types of dubbing like Senyo's laser dub and things like that this is tied in differently because it's tied in more like deer hair so we're gonna we're gonna pack it kind of the same as we move forward um, but it's the first kind of introduction to a different material when we're tying in a head with it and then how we trim it. Okay, so you should have two hooks in your package. Some of you have a couple of different sizes of hooks, so I'm going to tie it on the bigger one that we had. So my front hook is um, a Gamagatsu B10S and that's in a 2 aught. And then I'm going to tie, I think this is a size 6 is your back hook. Um, this is a streamer. Um, 2x long. We want a little bit longer hook for this one in the back because we're creating a little bit more, like we're using a, a longer profile in this fly, not as much bulk, um, which differs a little bit from the sex dungeon that we create a bulk by uh, wrapping schlappen up, whereas this one's a little different in that we're using trimmer or slimmer profile. Um, so you can go ahead and get that hook, that your smaller of the two hooks secured in your vise. And as a thread, I, I would go again with a, with a UTC. What other, whatever your color preference is. 
So today we're kind of the you got bar. It's like a green and black barred rabbit strip that you're tying on. I'm tying on a similar a similar one that you have. Just we have a run out of that one. Um, so white is a good color. Gray, brown, or gray or black is fine too. Okay, so let's start. Let's go ahead and we're gonna get our thread wound on. And stick with me on this fly, guys. This one is a little bit. It's 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 simple up until the head, and then it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, but just stick with me. It's a little bit longer of a fly, but we want to take the time to kind of kind of show you through some of these bull trout streamers. This is uh, tied in white or tied in a lighter color like this is a really effective pattern for bull trout. Um, bull trout aren't the smartest of fish in our province, and that's why they're you know they're becoming more and more endangered because they pretty much will eat anything that you throw at them if they're there. That's not always the case. A lot of times you do see them and they won't eat, but a lot of times they're just gonna, they're gonna smack whatever you throw at them. But a lighter color, most people think of throwing a white streamer for bull trout. I, I think black is really effective as well, but white is kind of what we go to. So that's kind of the color scheme we're gonna go with today. So in your package, first thing we're gonna tie in is a piece of marabou. So you're gonna have just a, a single piece of marabou. You've only got enough in your package for one of these flies. So you're gonna use all the materials that we have. <clears throat> so we're just gonna have one plume. This is just a strong marabou. Um, yeah, just a, just a strong marabou like this. This time we're going with a tan color. You could go with white on this pattern as well. It's just, it's just nice to kind of have a little diversity in the pattern as far as color is concerned. Um, a little trick with marabou that makes it a little easier for tying in, because it, it is a, a fluffy material. It likes to kind of splay out on you. Either wet your fingers or put it in your mouth and, and lick down it so that if we put a little bit of moisture on it, it pulls back for us and it's a little bit more manageable. The biggest thing we want to see is we want to be able to see the tips of it so we know how to, how to gauge our tie-in point. So more than anything, make sure that those tips are pulled down. So when I'm holding this, I'm going to hold it for me, my, my left hand, for you probably your right. What I want to do is I want this to hang off the back of the fly, that hook length. Okay, so this is, I'm going to set my fingers on my eye. I'm going to measure, make sure it's right at about the bend of the hook. And I'm going to transfer that back to that tying point and then tie it in. And we want to keep this, this marabou right up on top of the hook. So what we're going to do once we've tied it in right at that point, I'm going to, it's kind of a funny dance of holding, holding the back end of the butt end and just wrapping forward. Okay, we're going to wrap forward all the way to behind the eye, leaving yourself a couple eye lengths just so it's, we're not super bulky when we go to whip finish this off. We'll cut that off, make sure that's tied down, and then we'll just head back to the rear end of the fly again. Have any of you guys targeted bull trout in Alberta before? Yeah. yeah. Do you prefer to fish them on a sink tip or would you use just a floating line? What kind of setup do you use, Joe? A sink tip. And what weight of rod would you use? A secret. A secret, a secret <laughs> weight? <laughs> it's called being put on the spot. <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad option. Um, the biggest challenge, I guess, once you have, a, have one of these bigger fish on is just getting it landed. So it's okay to go a little heavier with your rod. I, personally, I fish with a seven weight streamer rod and I find that I'll fish that for trout on the, on the bow as well as fishing that for bull trout. Um, if you're dedicated for that rod to specifically be used for uh, streamer fishing, then go with a sink tip line on it so you don't have to worry about any of that. You can get those poly tip leaders that are sink tip um, and add them in after. It's just, you only really want to do that if, if, you, if you don't have that sinking line and if you have to make a bunch of switch ups. Um, you know, if you have a seven weight rod you like to use for nymphing and you're like, hey, well, I'll just, then I'll just throw a poly tip on it and that's fine. Otherwise, if you have a dedicated stream rod, it's good to go with a good, a good sinking line. You also want something because we're chucking flies that have, you know, might be anywhere from four inches to eight inches long for these fish. You want to, you want a line that's got a nice heavy, like they would call it a shooting head is a really good way of putting it. So what that means is in the front 30 feet, all the weight of the line is really in that front 30 feet. So it'll actually turn over that big fly. Um, we'll go with a, a shorter leader because these fish are not being leader shy. So we might go with three feet of whatever, pick your poundage of line, it doesn't matter. I like to go heavy, why not? Go with a 20 pound at least. Then you know you're not breaking them off because of their, their strength. It's more if you can get them hooked. 
Um, and then that, that, that's the setup that I would use. I'm um, going with the sink line, about two to three feet of, of that heavier tippet, and then right to your fly. We don't have to use a tapered lead or anything like that. You wouldn't be able to get the fly to turn over for you. Okay, so let's grab our crystal flash. So you're gonna have some of this stuff. This one is a, yeah, crystal flash. This is a larger one. So if you look at this, fi if, at this material, we can peel away some of those fibers so that we can expose the, the piece of thread in the middle that actually holds all those fibers on. And that's what we want to expose to tie in. If we tie in on just the crystal part, it could slip out on us. So we want to make sure we expose that under thread, tie it in, make sure it's good and locked down. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to advance my thread to just ahead of the hook point. So I don't want to be halfway up the hook not all the way halfway up, I just want to be slightly ahead of my hook point is where I'm going to stop my thread and that's where we're going <clears> to <throat> tie this off for a second. So how we wrap this guys is we actually want to be working with these fibers, pulling them back. So we want to stand the fibers up. So as I go here, I grab those fibers, make sure they kind of pull back. So I'm not, the, the point here is that I don't want to wrap those fibers underneath, underneath themselves so that we get as much of that crystal flash standing up as possible. So once I get to my hook, or sorry, once I get to my thread, I'm gonna tie that off real quick with just one wrap and kind of get it out of the way. Yeah? Were you going under or over? Under, over, what? Oh, it, it doesn't, yeah, good question. It doesn't matter which way you wrap, everybody has their own preference. Um, you know, if you're, if you're doing a pattern where you have wire out the back and you're wrapping something, you always wanna counter wrap them, but in this case we're not doing that, so pick your poison, it doesn't really matter. Go with whatever you want. So go ahead and grab that, that rabbit strip that you have in there. You just went past the hook point, right? Just past the hook point, yeah. So you should have a piece of rabbit zonker here, so it's rabbit fur. This stuff, the uh, pros and cons of this of this material, it looks very realistic in the water. It's fairly easy to tie with, but it holds water. Every time you pick it out, the water just doesn't shut out of it fast enough, so it's heavier. So it's gonna feel like your, your fly is a lot heavier once you pick it out of the water. It's gonna be a little harder to cast, but um, you wouldn't wanna cast this all day at, at 80 feet, but it's a really, it's a really good stuff to, to use. It's really realistic in the water. It moves a lot. You can see as you move it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna set this on top here, and we want those the back so if we again go ahead and and lick or wet your fingers so what we want to see is that we want to see the tips of the zonker to be just shy of the back end of that marabou so we want that marabou to be the very the very underside and the back sticking out the back end of what we're doing so right to the kind of the point there and then I'm I'm gonna look down to where that transfers to and grab your scissors, grab whatever, and we need to pull those fibers out of the way when we tie this in. Because if we don't, we're just gonna tie over top of them and they're not gonna be utilized. So try to pull some fibers back. So once I've kind of found the point I want, I pull them back, I'll lick my fingers again, both on the back end and the front end. If you put some moisture on them, it'll separate nicely for you. And that's where we're gonna tie in, okay? So do a nice loose wrap at first to kind of get it set where you want it. Pinch it so it's on top of the hook, pull down nice and tight. And then we're gonna put three or four nice tight wraps. Then we'll pull it back out of the way, put a few nice wraps right in front of it where we tied in. And then we can go ahead and advance our thread forward. And we're gonna leave our thread right behind the eye. Okay, so try to get that to kind of stay out of the way. Now we're gonna go back to our crystal flash. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue wrapping our crystal flash right up to the eye. We'll tie it off and we'll cut it out, okay? And save that piece because you're gonna use it in the front as well. So pull that out of the way. Just keep wrapping now in front of that zonker. Pulling those fibers so they're rearward. And 
and we're gonna stop a little bit shy of that hook eye just so we don't crowd the head. Righty. <laughs> it's not listening to me. It's too focused. Listening, not a not acknowledging my my okay, gotcha. That's fair. Good, so we kind of want, that's what we want it to look like. Once you get that wrapped up, we're gonna pull that zonker back over top and tie it down right behind the eye. Just remember to do it exactly the same we did before. When we pull it down, we wanna pull those fibers out of the way so we're not trapping any down. and then we'll tie it in right behind the eye. And again, just making sure it's staying oriented so it's on top of the hook. So do a few wraps on top and then pull that zonker back, put some wraps in front of it, and then we're gonna whip finish it right there. And once you got it whip finish, you can go ahead and snip, snip off the zonker uh, right there. Okay. <laughs> the mic day? And then we're just gonna snip that zonker out. So that's gonna be the rear portion of our fly. So as you can tell already, this is a lot slimmer profile than the other bigger streamer we've tied. Um, but it dances really nice in the water, especially that zonker up top. Lots and lots of movement. So let's get that whip finished, guys, and you can take it out and you can get your next hook secured in your vise. So you've decided to get your rod, but you're confused as to how you go about getting all the parts. Well, I've created a custom rod form on the website. Um, it, it'll go specifically in detail, step by step. One where you're gonna start, last step is where you're gonna finish. So we can start with the thread wraps, the reel seat, the grips. They come in all wide, wide different ranges. There'll be a bunch of options supplied on the website. As you go through, There'll be simple click and click and then you'll be able to get what you want. And then down at the end, there'll be a note section for any additional things you would like to add to your rod, meaning your name, personalization, you'd like a different, you know, you'd like every guide to be a different color. Everything's possible. And I believe the easier I make this process for you, the less stressful it is. And I've realized that as going through people don't fully understand and, and that's why I'm here and, and that's what Classic Custom Rods is going to supply is communication between the both of us at the fullest to make you as comfortable as possible through this whole process. Brush it out and a lot of those fibers that get stuck will, will come back out. So, or at least stand them up a little bit. Yeah, no worries. Okay, we'll continue to the, fr to the fun and the front half of the fly. So again, when we're tying these, uh, these articulated streamers, a lot of times your back hook is gonna be a more standard long shank hook or, or what have you. It's just gonna be more of a standard hook. We really like to use those, the, a stinger style hook in the front, excuse me, in the front. Um, it gives us, a, it just gives us a lot more almost 
area for that fish to grab onto. And if they're if they're going to come up and pass or get a you know side swipe at this fly, um, they're still going to get stung really good. The, just the angle, the hook is a lot different on these flies, and it's nice for tying in. Like we're going to use the beads and the wire to tie um, this, the back fly onto the front one, and it's it's nice that the the hook falls away from it. It keeps it oriented away from the hook, so there's less chance of it getting tangled back on it. Um, the theory of the beads is that it wouldn't allow, it shouldn't be able to get snagged on itself, but they still do sometimes. So, but using a, a styled hook like this can, can help with that. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll put a good thread base down on the entire hook again. So start behind the eye, work your way back. Yeah, we're just going to go to the top of the bend. We'll go ahead and grab the, dumb, the set of dumbbell eyes that you have in there. So we just have, uh, these are like an unpainted eye. You could use a pupil eye, you could use whatever you want. Um, if you want it to look more realistic, you can add one with eyes. What this is really doing, especially with bull trout, is a lot of times the biggest challenge to, to catching them, if they're not moving, if we're not catching them on the move and they're more resident, they're normally in a lot deeper pools. And so we're really trying to get down to them. So lots of times, even for myself, on both of these hooks, I would have wrapped lead wire. So really, you're just hucking a bomb and ducking most of the time. Um, it, you're just really essentially trying to get to the bottom. That's why I mentioned about the sink tip. A lot of times on those sink tip lines, that sink tip could be integrated from maybe an eight foot leader all the way to a 15. So you got a lot more weight dragging that fly to the bottom. It's easier to kind of dredge the bottom of a pool um, with a much heavier fly. So, so what we want to do for a tie-in point is we want to give ourselves two eye lengths behind the eye. And that's where we're gonna, we're gonna make our first wrap to tie this in. So again, there's no real science to putting a pair of dumbbell eyes on, but what the only piece of science to it is that we want to do equal to one side as the other. So a figure eight is good to lock it in. Doing multiple wraps in one direction, well, unfortunately what it will do if I do a bunch in one direction, it pulls the dumbbell eyes so they're um, oriented either forward or back from where we want them to be. So it's important that we do equally as much on both sides. Make sure that you do go just around the eyes above the hook because that'll pull all your threads in tight. So right now this is how we start normally guys is when, it, when those dumbbell eyes are up on top of the hook, we get them tied in, we get them fairly tight on top and then we're gonna swing them to the bottom because we want the hook point to ride down on this fly. <laughs> so if you put, and it might be, seem like a silly thing for me to say, but I know some people haven't understood it before, but if I look at this fly right now, I put all that weight on top of the hook. So that's going to want to turn over and sit at that direction. So if I were to put that in the water right now, it wants to sit like this. And there's instances and patterns where that is what we want to do. This one just isn't one of them. So what I want it to do is to ride hook point down. So I'm going to spin those eyes around. I'm going to finish tying them in, making sure they're tight and even. And it helps to take a, a front profile of, your, of it and make sure that they're straight. I like to take a, a spot of whatever, some, some type of head cement. This would be a good place for super glue as well. And we're just gonna dab it right on top of there. <laughs> good. Okay. So what you're going to find in there is you're going to find a piece of wire and two beads as well. So I'm, a, I'm personally a bit of a bead snob. Um, you can get really cheap beads and, and different beads that act kind of differently. I, I, re I really like a, a nice glass bead um, that just has a little bit of glow in it. So if you just get a plain bead, these ones are, I got this out of Fabricland and Red Deer. They're just called a, a check bead. I don't know. They're the only one, they're the ones I really like to use. But they got the point is on the inside they got some flash built into them, so if they refract light really well, and it's nice to just have a little bit of extra something in the fly. So I want you to take that piece of wire, and I get questions about the wire that I use a lot because a lot of people they go out there and they buy you know some like Rio 
um, bite wire or something like that. And that stuff is so expensive. And in, if you're tying a lot of streamers, you do go through it quite quickly. This stuff is like my absolute go-to. This is just a craft material. It's called Beetalon. I get it from Michael's. Um, it's just a seven strand. You get 60 feet for like eight bucks. It lasts a long time in comparison. And it's thinner, which I like. It's easier to work with on trout streamers. I might go with something different on a pike fly. Um, but for trout streamers, it's really nice. Sorry? Yeah, you know, it's, I find it too supple. I want it to be, I do, like, it's a good question. You could use, you know, Dacron. You could even use, like, a heavy fluoro or mono. Um, but I like the wire because it's stiff enough to keep things pointed out the back end. Whereas if I use something that's softer, it's got even more movement. And there is such thing as too much movement on that rear hook. We don't want it coming up and getting fouled a lot. So it's nice to have it a little stiffer. So I'm just going to take a piece of this. Oh man, I shouldn't have broke that. Yeah. And you got a spring. I broke that piece and now it's just a mess. What did I do with it? See if that'll hold anything. Yeah, sort of. Okay, so go ahead and grab those two beads and let's go and grab the back end fly that we just had. So there's a few different ways of doing it, of to tying these in, but what I, what I find works really well <clears throat> is I'm gonna go and stick my wire through the hook, hook point. Oh man, I'm struggling. It's so small. So I stick it through the hook, hook point. I'm gonna gather it in half. I'm gonna even up the tips of the wire. Once I have those evened up, I'm going to take those two beads, I'm going to put it over top of both of them. So slide the bead on, we can slide it back a bit. Same thing with the second bead, slide it back a bit. Need some more? Okay, so but what you don't want to do is let go of those tips because those beads will go flying. So kind of keep them pinched back a little bit. So when I'm when I'm going to orient this fly, so what we're going to do is we're just going to tie this right in on top of the hook, okay? So when I'm looking for a distance or a length, I'm actually going to come down that hook bend a little bit with my thread. So I'm thinking that I'm going to be right about there. That's about the distance I want. I want those two beads to have a little bit of room, so like a three beads worth of room. Um, but I want those beads to stay up towards the fly away from that back hoop of the bend there, okay? So think of having enough space for three beads, but only using it for two. And what I should have done is bring your thread all the way back to the bend. You can go down the bend just a smidge. Find that distance that you want. And the good thing about this is you can do a few loose wraps up, and then I can still slide this back and forth so I can get the adjustment size that I want. So I want those beads to come off that hook. I'm gonna get myself to there. And for me, I have this, a lot of us have this on their vices. They have no idea what it's for. It's just a material clip. So I like, especially even for hooks, I like to use it. It holds it back out of our way. And now at that point, I can take this and just cover it with a ton of thread wraps. I like to get fairly close to behind the eye. And depending on how long your wire is, fold it back over once. And then just pack it with thread. It'd be a good time before you totally cover it up just to put a little spot of whatever head cement you have on top of those wraps. It's very unlikely that this will ever pull out. That's not going to be the part of the fly that fills. But for, uh, you know, when you're, if you're to go to the store and buy this fly, you're probably paying 10, 10, 12 bucks. So if you're taking the time to tie it, you don't want it to come undone on you. So get it wrapped down nice and tight. <laughs> How are we doing guys? You got any questions? Good? You guys at home, same thing. Ask any questions if you have any. 
We just want to give a little bit of a thanks again to uh, Caribou Craft Brewery here. Um, we thank them every week, but we want to keep thanking them. They're so accommodating to allowing us to be here. Um, they serve us good beer, so we got really nothing to complain about. So remember to come back and check them out even when we're not here. Okay, guys. The one thing I will say about working with this wire is unless you have a really crummy pair of scissors, you probably shouldn't cut them with those. So I always just carry a really tiny pair of um, wire, wire cutters. They're, there's nothing to them, they're really tiny, but it's just good to cut them. You'll, save your, you'll give a lot more life to your scissors over time if you're not trashing them on wire. If you got a pair of wire scissors, like you don't care about trashing them, go right ahead. <laughs> yeah. Borrow your neighbor's scissors if you want to cut your wire. <laughs> Okay, so you should be left with some more crystal flash. We're gonna use that for the front half. If you end up with not enough, let us know and we'll get you another piece of it. Not sure what I did with my other piece. Oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna wrap up before we tie the zonker in. So first thing we're gonna do here, guys, is we're, gonna, we're not gonna tie in that next piece of rabbit zonker right away. We're actually gonna tie in our crystal flash first and we're gonna wrap this forward. So expose a little bit of those again so we can tie them in nice. Tie in right where you ended your, your wire so it's right at the back. We want this to be the first thing that's seen up next to those beads. So once we tie that in, what we can do is we can wrap our thread forward. And I'm gonna leave about, um, no, it went out. Oh yeah, yeah. I got a little bit of that rabbit strip as well. That's yep. Uh, that's a little too short. Oh yeah, that's not gonna work. Sure, Sorry, who needs a piece, sir? Uh, we'll Thank probably you. all. Well, we didn't get very big. Okay. Not very long. Okay, here we go. Funny, funny, funny. There's no complaints last night. Here we go. Need a piece, sir? Yep. Some more? Yeah, let's well, uh, side. You give you some more. I'm not sure. You'll make yours work. Okay. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Grab some more. So I am gonna need these. Just yeah, right back here. It's so Do we have some more too? Yep, absolutely. Sorry guys, we weren't too sure how to judge the length on this one. You guys need some more or are you good? Good? Um, no, we'll give you some more. That's not gonna be quite enough. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Okay guys. <laughs> And you needed some rabbit strip, right? Okay. So what I want you to do is just like we did before, we're gonna wrap that crystal flash forward. So I'm right at the back. I'm gonna make sure that I do one full wrap at the back before I start moving forward. And as you see guys, what I'm doing here with my fingers is I'm just drawing those far fibers back. Only briefly so that when I wrap down, I'm not, I'm not grabbing those pieces and tucking them under that thread because they're going to be hard to get out. Okay? So as I go around, I'm just grabbing those fibers, pulling them back, making the next wrap. And we're gonna leave that one dumbbell eyes width or length behind the eyes. We're gonna leave that without the crystal flash. And we'll do a gathering wrap and tie it off. And we can snip out the end. Make sure we get that tied down nice. Okay, so grab, once we have that all tied in, we're gonna grab that piece of rabbit strip that we have left over. And we should have enough, enough length. If you don't, let me know. So 
So how we're gonna judge this here, guys, is we're gonna tie in a piece, and it's only gonna get tied in one spot now, so we're gonna tie it in once right behind the eyes. And as we're, as we're judging length of it, it's not super critical that it's, it's all the way back to here, but if we have the length on it, we can draw it back. We just don't want it to be longer than those tips basically touching the bars on the next one. So if these were, if these were two white colors without bars and we couldn't tell where we wanted them to lay, we just want it to just cover up where those beads are. So just lay across the beads, slightly up onto the next material. Okay, find that place, pull the material back again out of the way, and we'll tie it in there. Yeah, basically want it to be just past the, so, yeah, that's perfect. So, yeah, you have a perfect length right there, so just tie it in right there. Yeah. Looks good. So, again, working with that rabbit strips is good if you keep wetting your fingers, you can keep stuff out of the way. So, we really want to make sure, guys, because this is the one tie-in point for this, um, we want to get it wrapped down really good. If you've, ever, if you've ever fished with this material before, what you notice from it is that as it's wet and dries, wet and dries, wet and dries, that leather that is the back of it will eventually dry and crack and tear and it'll be gone. So having only one tying point, we just want to make sure that it's really good and secure right there. Um, that is the risk with these flies is eventually they will. <laughs> yep, just behind the eye, yeah. Eventually that rabbit strip will um, kind of dry out and crack. So then wraps over top of it, wraps in front of it, and then you can snip it out. So that's what we're left with right now. So that's what it looks like. So, ugh. I got a lot of hair in my mouth. If you guys want a second to grab another beer, if you're out, I'll give you a minute. Um, we can take a second here and before we get moving on again. This is the part, this is kind of a good part to break before we really head into the, the complicated piece of the fly, which is the head. So if you want a beer, go ahead and grab one. We'll just be a second here before we keep going. So this might seem like a big streamer to some of you as it sits here and when we're finished. This is, this is actually maybe on the smaller side for what we'd actually fish for bull trout. A lot of times, you know, I'm fishing stuff that's the full length of this vise um, for bull trout. They will eat a really big fish. Um, I guess it depends on the size of bull trout that you find, but there are some fairly large bull trout. Depending on who you ask, they can get quite big. Um, <laughs> sometimes they keep getting bigger, it's crazy. It starts at 30 inches and it gets to 40 somehow, I don't know, but. Um, yeah, it also depends how many beer you've had, maybe. But there always seems to be a lack of pictures. I don't know, it's just weird. Mm -hmm. My hands are really good. I don't know what you're saying. I don't. Dana has really nice sign language, but he's the only one who understands what he's saying when he does it. Yeah. <laughs> so for any of you guys at home that are just, uh, you might be just tuning in now or you came in kind of halfway through, um, there's a few things we want to kind of talk about that we got coming up here with Fly Fishing Bull River. We want to kind of reiterate that we, uh, we have a guide school coming up. So if you have anyone who's interested, we call it a guide school. Um, you can think of it a lot more like a guide apprenticeship program or even, it's not just for guides, it's for anybody who wants to learn to row a boat, is thinking about buying a boat, wants to know this river better, um, wants a little bit more knowledge about working with clients if it's something you want to do in the future. Um, it's an interesting thing we have here in Alberta because unlike BC, we don't have any regulations as far as guides here, to be quite honest. So you don't, you're not required to go to a school, you're not required to carry any special license. Joe Blow could come here today and say, I'm gonna guide on the Bow River and they're gonna do it. And they could, they could do it. Legally, they could do that. Um, but what we're hoping to do is to give a little bit of instruction, a little bit of direction so that we have more informed guides on the river. Um, if people are interested in wanting to do it for themselves, you know, there might be, we would rather them be informed when they go out there versus we end up having issues with them on the river in the future. So um, they're gonna do it anyways if they want to. So let's help them get in the right direction. So. 
we've, uh, we've put together a program that's going to happen the first two weekends of June. Um, it, is, it is pretty booked up, but we might be able to squeeze in a couple more if we had to. So uh, yeah, just let us know. It's going to be over two weekends, so six days, 60 plus hours in the water. Um, weather permitting, there will be an overnight in that as well. Um, yeah, just to kind of give some direction to that. So if you know anybody who's interested, let us know. Um, also, March 28th, I believe it's 7 o'clock, right Dana? 7 o'clock? Yeah, so March 28th at 7 o'clock in Red Deer, we're doing uh, an, a viewing of the I4 Film Festival from this year. So if you have any interest in coming down and watching that, if you missed it up here, um, you can buy your tickets online or come join us uh, and then come join us. You can buy tickets at the door as well if you needed to. Also, if you want or you're interested in booking some trips with Fly Fishing Bow River, um, it's a good time to get on it. On spring here, we still have stuff open, although it is starting to book up. So it's a good time to, if you have specific dates or a, you know, a birthday to buy for or something, it's a good time to do it because you might get the date that you want. Oh okay, yeah, I think everybody's back from their beer run. Oh, not quite. We got a couple. Jared, how are we doing over there? Jared. Good? Okay. Good, good. Am I thirsty? I'm okay. I gotta, I gotta drive, I'll be responsible. Yeah, okay, you're doing your own thing? All right, you do your own thing, that's fine. Well, let's give it a couple minutes here, guys, make sure everybody's back and we'll keep going. Do you foresee that? Well, you know, it's an interesting question. We, what we do have here in Alberta right now is we have something called AOGAA, um, and it's an anglers association that most, like me and Dana are part of it. A lot of, I will say the more, um, I'll hesitate to say, but more legitimate guides, they're wanting to use the organization because we are truly trying to move forward to that. So hopefully we're gonna be something more like BC where you know, there are guidelines. Like you do have to pass a test to be a guide in the province. You do have to be licensed so that um, not just anybody can be on the river. You know, the Bow River is a very special place and it's, it's getting a pounded pretty hard. Um, so we would like to have more regulations in place that help assist with that. Um, but I think it needs to start with the, with the guides. We need, we, need to be, we need to be in something. So we are part of an organization and that organization is really moving as hard as they can forward, but it's just resistance from the government, right? Because there's just, there's nothing in place. There never has been. So it's just a... Is that an organization that Yeah, you could, you could absolutely, you could join it. Yeah. Um, and it could keep you informed as to what's going on. Most of the time, what it does is, mostly it's just guides who are in it because, you know, they're the group of guys that are coming together to really hopefully push, push the program forward. Um, but it is for anyone who wants to be part of it. Um, yeah, basically to get in though, you you kind of have to have an association with some with someone who is an outfitter who is in the in the organization already, and they can vouch that yes, you are going to be guiding for them, or you're going to be you know. But not everybody is a guide that's in there. There is people who are just there to be in, informed, but it's normally that kind of the purpose of it is for the guides, um, and then hopefully we're going to bring that information we got back and we can give it to you guys. But that's. That's kind of where we're at in the program right now. They are making they are making moves forward, and like we're we're happy with that. It just seems like it's a, it's it's we just you hit you hit walls every time you, you take ten steps forward, right? You take steps back, but you're dealing with the government. Yeah, and honestly, yeah, and it's not the it's not the government's fault. It's just that there's nothing in place yet, so we're trying to work forward with that process. So it's a work in progress. Yeah. Okay, guys, I think we're all back now. So let's uh, tackle the fun part of the fly. So you guys have a piece of red material there and that's actually we're just using um, EP fibers y you could use a ton of different things I sometimes use like even a crystal flash all we want to do is make a gill plate so this is going to show out um, it's just a, a bit of red where the gills would be on this on this bait fish it can be a little bit at times it's just like an attractor for them to want to strike um, some people some people <laughs> that's really loud some people would swear that you know that red mark on an all-white bull trout streamer is the is the game changer. That's what makes it happen. I don't know if I believe that or not, but it is something we can put in pretty easily, so it doesn't hurt to do it. So you guys have just one one piece. You can probably, yeah, you could probably even split it in half. It's it is pretty big. You'll know once you tie it in, kind of what it looks like. But for me, I'm gonna I'm gonna use a piece that's you know yay big. We're gonna trim it a little bit once we tie it in. So. 
what I want you to do is we can tie it in and then cut it. So I'm gonna flip, if you have a rotary vise, flip your ears upside down. What we wanna do is tie this right in behind the dumbbell eyes. And we are gonna trim this, so don't be, don't be afraid to let it hang back because we will trim it into place a little bit. But what I do wanna do is when I put it in, I kinda wanna flatten it out so that it doesn't just tie in in one small spot behind the head, but that it spreads out a little bit. So if I take a wrap and I let my bobbin hang, I can then work that material so it's, it's around, even up onto the sides just a little bit and spread it out and then take a couple more wraps to secure it in place and then we'll take wraps as well in front of it and then for the butt ends we'll reach in and tie them, or cut them off real close so for instance in this one that red is coming back almost to the back of that crystal flash and I don't want it to be all, that, all the way back there because I want to show some of that underbelly. But also, when we put in all this, uh, this sculpin wool up at the head, it is going to cover back a little way. So I don't want to trim too much. I want a little bit of crystal flash showing out the back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to trim it off pretty flat. So for me, I'm happy with that right there. So you know you're going to see a little bit of that red coming out the back end. And if it doesn't, we'll, tr we'll trim our sculpin wool so that it does. So if you need to see it a little better there. I basically cut it about, from the dumbbell eyes to the back of the bend, I've cut it about half that length. So I've still got half of my crystal flash showing. Okay. So once we got that in guys, what we're going to do is we're going to go find that sculpin wool we have. You guys have white, I'm going to use gray just because it's what I have right here. <clears throat> this wool is a couple of things about wool. It floats really well, so you could add it, you could add it to certain streamers and leave it in bulk because if you wanted it to swim closer to the surface, you could have dumbbell eyes and still leave it up top. We're going to put it in and we're going to attempt to trim it down quite, quite thin because we can shape a really nice head with it. It gives a little bit of floatability, but on this fly, that's not the feature we're looking at. We're looking at it more because of what we can do with the head, not because of its, the fact that it floats a little bit. Because we actually, like I said before, want the streamer to get pretty deep. Okay, so find that wool. You're gonna have a strip of it, and if you don't have enough, let me know. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to, um, to gauge because everybody's gonna tie it in a little bit different and a little bit um, with different thickness of pieces. But basically what I've done for you guys, I've taken off and just cut off a piece of it. And so you're left with a chunk like this. So this is actually, it doesn't look like a ton, but it's a ton of wool because what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take a little, a little piece, let's say like this off of it. And I'm just gonna, just like we would do with dubbing. So if I haven't shown you this in previous weeks, just you can pay attention a little bit more here. But I'm gonna grab from both ends and I'm gonna tear it apart. So now I'm left with two pieces of this stuff and I'm gonna stack it back on top of itself evenly and pull it out again. And just continue this process over and over. So what we're doing is we're separating out those fibers and we're gonna attempt to get them fairly aligned. It's not okay if the tips aren't perfectly even, but what this does is increase the volume of this material quite a bit. So you can tell from what you started with to once you start pulling it apart, it just grows, it almost gets fluffy. And that's what we wanna do with it. It's so fluffy I could die. <laughs> yeah, I got kids. <laughs> So then you just kind of pull out those little rogue pieces that are going out of the way. So now I've taken that short piece, very thin, and now it's really fluffy. It's, it's quite a fluffy, uh, I can't stop saying it now, <laughs> it's so fluffy. <laughs> so what we're going to do when we tie this in is we're always going to tie it in 50-50. There is instances when we tie in, let's say dubbing, which we wouldn't do this, but with this specific material because we're going to trim it all out, we're going we're gonna to tie it in 50-50. And what that means is I'm going to split it right down the middle. So the first one I'm going to do, lay that back a bit, is right there behind the eye. I'm going to hold it down and halfway through it, I'm going to take one, one wrap and pull it nice and tight. So that's laid like so. I'm going to pull that piece back and I'm going to put some wraps in front of it. And we're going to leave it like that. I know it's going to seem like that piece wants to come forward, but once we start stacking them in here and we kind of fluff them up, <laughs> they're, all going to, they're all going to lay back. Okay, so the first one we do is just like that.
and depending on the amount of bulk that we want out of this specific fly, we could tie, we might tie more or less stacks of this stuff. And what we're actually going to do on this first one is we're going to tie on the sides as well, and that gives us a little bit more um, diversity to the width of its head that we can trim into it. Um, whereas when we go in front of the eye, we're not going to add in those side pieces as much as we do right now. So this time, for our next piece that we're going to tie in, I want you to take less less wool okay so just a just a small pinch so I've just got just a very little bit here and again we're gonna pull it apart and stack it pull it apart and stack it so for you guys at home if you can't see I'm just pulling stacking back on top pinching it again stacking back on top aligning it the best I can so I'm left with this so then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one of these smaller pieces and put it on each side of the fly. So the first one I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put it right here, hold it down so it's gonna stay right on the side, take that same first wrap and pull it in and pull that wrap so it wants to snug up to those eyes, and then pull it back and do a couple wraps, okay? So really all we're doing now, as you can see, this stuff almost marries together. So if I were to take a comb and comb it, it just wants to comb itself together. So it, it, ha it naturally wants to come together. So it, it's gonna fill up really nicely behind the head here. So I did that on one side, I'm just gonna reciprocate that and do it on the other side. So again, just another small pinch. Fluff up your wool. And the difference with deer hair is here guys, if you mess up, just unwrap it, pull it out and redo it. Like it's nice, we're not gonna, we didn't stack all this hair and, and pull it tight and it flares and then we dump, dump it all. We can keep working with this stuff, which is kind of a nice feature. So again, now I'm gonna go to the other side. So now we're left on the bottom with just one little, one little portion of the bottom that hasn't been done. And I'm gonna take another, so the first pinch was fairly big, the next ones were quite small. This one I'm gonna land somewhere in the middle, okay, between that. So not a huge pinch, not a super small pinch. And this is what we're gonna tie in the bottom. Keeping in mind, you're about to cover up that red gill plate we put in, but we will trim it back so you'll see it again. So take that clump, it's maybe a little much for me. And we'll tie it in right on the bottom the same way we've tied in before, that 50-50. And once I've tightened that in, I can advance my threads in front of the dumbbell eyes. So as we stand right now, we got a big floofy mess here. So I don't have a bunch for you guys, so I feel bad using it, but I don't feel bad using it. Now I can't even find it. Oh, sorry, here. A nice little trick that if you remember when we worked with EP fibers earlier um, during salt month, these gator clamps, I like to do this on these flies as well, is just to get it out of the way, hair clips or whatever, but at the same time, you can just, as you're working, hold it out of the way like so. It's just a nice tool to use. Okay, so again, let's go with that, that first clump we did, let's go with another, another clump that big. We'll pull it all apart. You guys doing okay? You're keeping up all right? Let me know if any, I know this is a lot of stages, so slow me down if you need me to. You want to pick it up a little? Okay. <laughs> so this next one, guys, we're gonna tie back in on top. Okay? So this one, you know, this is, it's kind of a, it's a, I don't even know how to explain this to you very well, but what I'm doing is if you can imagine if I take my thread here and I put it behind that dumbbell eye there, that pulls it back down against itself and backwards. Whereas if I were to just, if I just took this and wrapped it right here in front, that's gonna pull that up and I'm gonna be left with that gap like that. So just like how I do with deer hair, what I'm gonna do, holy crap, it's loud. Yeah. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wrap initially, and this is, it sucks because I'm left-handed, so it's not showing it very well, but I'm gonna go behind the eye first. So you see how I go behind the eye, 
And when I come around to the bottom, I'm again staying behind the eye as I go over top of it. And that pulls it right on top of that eye, right on top of the dumbbell eyes instead of it pulling it forward. Did that make sense? Do you want me to show you again? I'll show you on the bottom because I need to do it down there again. And then I can. So we want to flip that over and we want to do the exact same thing we just did. How I showed you going behind the dumbbell eyes, we want to do that again right on top of the dumbbell eyes right there on the bottom. So same size of clump. <laughs> did you cut your thread? <laughs> so fluffy. No, it's not bad because we got lots more. You're going to do a nice timely transition to a gray area to finish that. <laughs> really? Well, I didn't. <laughs> okay, so again, flip it over, we'll do it to the bottom. It's actually kind of sad because we put all this in and then we cut most of it out, but it's, it's important that we get the full coverage that we need so that when we go to trim it, there's not going to be any gaps. And there still might be, and it's okay. That's the, a little bit of the downfall of this material is it's just, if you, when, you, when you put hair in and you pull down and you, you stacked it and you flared it, your thread disappears into the hair and you can't see it anymore. Whereas this stuff, it's not flaring, it's not doing anything. Um, so it can, there's a tendency that we could be left with you know, little openings, but that's why we're gonna kind of comb it together a little bit before we trim it. And hopefully we, ow, hopefully we fix that, stab myself. Okay, so now that we got, we're now in front of the eyes, okay? So we've done those one on top of the dumbbells in each place. We're gonna take another clump, guys, the same size that we have been, so that bigger clump, pull it apart. And to finish this now, we just need to stack one on top and one on bottom. And if you haven't proportioned your, your wool, or I didn't proportion your wool appropriately, just let me know and we'll give you a little bit more, a little bit more gray, okay? Which is kind of cool, you got a two-tone hand there. Did you, did you do it on top or on the bottom? Wait. I would go top. Gray on top? Mm -hmm. Doing one more on top. One more on top, one more on bottom, yeah. yeah. That would be enough for both of you easily. You need some more? Yes. Okay. You got two chunks. I'll just grab you one and you split, split it because it'll yeah. be plenty. Does anybody else need some more wool? Thank you. You guys okay? With that same technique where you're going in behind the... No, this, sorry, I'll correct myself there. No, on this, on these last two, these ones we are gonna tie right where we lay them, just like we did behind when we started. So these ones we're not gonna tuck behind the dumbbell eye because we want these now to finish the nose. So we're gonna tie them right on top. So, no, I've lost mine. Sorry, in, like in front of the eye, but on top of the hook. So I'm gonna finish off by and this, I actually find this to probably be the most difficult part because at this point we've got all this fur already here and it's kind of in our way. But we're gonna take one wrap over top to cinch down, pull those fibers back, get some thread wraps ahead of them. We'll do the same thing on the bottom. Someone is very excited over there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if you've kept up so far, this should be our last piece. We should put a piece on the bottom and we should be ready to whip finish. So I actually find this to be the absolute hardest, hardest piece of the whole thing. Just because we got so much going on. We really want to try to make sure it stays oriented on the bottom, just like the top piece stayed on the top. 
we want to build up a little bit of a thread down. So what I mean by that is I'm going to work my thread forward to the eye, then back, forward, then back, right behind the eye so that we are pulling those fibers back. And so what I've noticed here, guys, if, uh, if you can look at my fly, I've got a little bit of a gap right here and you can see my white thread come through it. That's not the end of the world. We can trim it right there. I'm going to fill it in because I've got, the, I've got the wool here. It'll just take a tiny little piece to do it on each side. And all I'm going to... Yeah, absolutely. If anybody needs some on the way down, just take a piece off of this. So that's a nice piece about this wool is if you see a little gap, you can just fill it with it. You don't have to get, it's not like deer hair where once you spun it, it's spun and that's it. So I see a little gap there. So I'm gonna do exactly the same thing that I just did on the top and bottom. I'm just gonna do it on the side. And once you're happy with the coverage, then we'll whip finish it. Yeah, so you wanna, that's not bad though. Like it's okay to have a little bit of space behind the eye, but you, it looks like you should have maybe a little bit more on the top. Okay. Just to kind of finish it out. Okay. And you can decide how far you wanna move it forward. If you see mine, mine's really bushy and I've built it almost to the head and that's kind of where I like to finish for trimming, but it's, it's really a personal, yeah, that's good. That's good, right up to the eye. Okay, one more small piece for myself and then I will be done. We can whip finish it and then we get on to trimming. Absolutely. You got some? Okay. Okay, last piece for me here. Once you're happy with it, go ahead and whip finish it. Like I said, what I'm doing right now is totally unnecessary. I'm just doing it because I can. What's that? So let's get a little bit of a, a little bit of a thread down behind the behind the hook eye and we'll whip finish and then we're gonna trim. So this will put your whip finishing uh, expertise to work if you can hold all of the foam or all of the wool out of the way. You did it? All right, get up here. Teach it left-handed. I had to teach it to you right-handed. <laughs> And we will put a spot of glue on that once we've done our trimming. Hey, bud. So what we're gonna do now is, this is just a lot of, uh, a lot of mess, but we, what we wanna do is we wanna draw all those fibers up. So you can just fluff them out. So it should look something like that, big and messy. Oh my goodness, it's everywhere. Okay, I'll wait for everybody to kind of get to this point and then we're gonna, um, then we'll trim together. There is a little bit of a method to the madness of the starting of the trim and then it just kind of go crazy after that. Okay guys, is everybody whip finished? Good to go. Okay guys, let's get this party started. So we got all of our fibers pulled out. I'm gonna flip it over so it's upside down. So if we think about the profile of this fly when we're finished, we want a little bit of a domed head, but we want a fairly flat bottom. So, also if you have two pairs of scissors and one of them's good and one of them's not, excuse me, not, go with the ones that are not as good because the wool is a little hard on the, on the scissors. Um, if you do a ton of cutting with them, it can dull them a bit, so your choice. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull all those fibers up and I'm gonna stick my scissors in and I'm bracing off the eye here and I'm gonna kinda angle it back, if you can see the hook point there, 
I'm just thinking about angling to that hook point and I'm gonna cut. And you can, at least for here, try to control your mess a little bit so we can pick it all up. So that's my first cut. I've done it an angle back. And now I'm gonna be able to pull it up one more time and I'm gonna try to separate those red fibers that I had underneath and cut again. Absolutely. So I got a fairly nice flat profile. Now we're going to abandon the bottom for a second and flip it back up the top. So now that I'm up here, I'm, I'm essentially going to do the same thing, except I'm going to, I'm going to think about with my scissors, I'm going to think about making a little bit of a curved cut to it. And I'm just going to dome it a little bit. We're going to probably trim that dome down. But the big thing to keep in mind is the first trim is the easiest one because you can hold these fibers. Once we've cut the first one, then we got to get in there and get all finicky and try to cut and it's harder. So think about that dome. We don't want it to be super big, but I'm going to come in almost at a 45 to start with. Start cutting and I'm going to turn my scissors almost flat. Don't want to cut my rabbit strip. Come off like that. Remembering for this streamer, I want it to be a smaller head because I want it to sink faster. So if I left all of this on here, it would be, it would float too much. So I'm gonna take as much off as I can. Now I'm gonna come over to the sides. If I turn it up flat, I'm just gonna kinda of come in. I can feel those eyes are right there and I wanna basically get up against the eyes and I'm just gonna trim. I'm gonna trim until I can see them. So nice and flat, flatten out that side. Any of those longer fibers that kind of go out behind that, that red flash, I'm going to get rid of them. Just keep trimming down until you can see that dumbbell eye. So it's fairly flat. I can see it now. Clear it up a bit. <laughs> yeah. If you're a dog groomer, this is great for you. Okay, now we're going to flip it to the other side and we'll do the exact same thing. A little trick guys that I, I forgot to show you as well is, it depends a little bit on your vice as well, but what you see me do a lot is I place one hand on my vise and I take my, my scissors when I go to cut and I'm bracing my thumb with them. So instead of just, if you're worried about rotating around and moving, if I've braced my hand and now I've got another point of contact, I can get in there and I can do more precision cuts and I'm not worried about snipping something. It's a really nice kind of way of trimming is just always contact with your vise, contact somewhere else in your other hand. I normally do it to my scissors and then I can make my trims. Even better for more precise ones. So now I'm gonna, for myself, I'm looking at that head. I'm still not happy with how the, the top end of the dome, so I'm gonna flatten it off again. I want it to be even more of a narrower profile. And then I can get almost onto the edges of the sides, so that the area between the top and the sides, and I'm gonna start rounding it out. So at this point, it just becomes a bunch of this. We're just trimming, trimming, trimming until we're happy with how the head looks and the profile that you want. So the profile that I've kind of depicted to you is that I want it to be flat on the bottom and that I want it to be slight rounded on top, but I want a minimal amount of wool on here so that I can still have a good sinking property of the fly. And what else I do is I, I'll pull down those red fibers and I'll get my scissors up underneath the wool and I'll cut it back a little bit. So now that, that, now that red is, well now it's covering it, but now that red is much more visible because that is a piece of the fly we put in, so we want to show it. And this is the part where I said there's no real science to it. You just get to trim until you're, until you're done, until you think you're happy with the head, the shape of the head. You know what a bait fish looks like, so you're just trying to accomplish something close to that. Something I forgot to bring today that I actually really like for on wool is that cauterizing tool I showed you guys a couple weeks ago. Um, 
it, it really works well on, on wool, I find. Especially when you're trying to clean up around the eyes. If you can't get your scissors in there and trim it, that little cauterizer is just, it's just magic. <clears throat> oh, Dane's got one here. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so this, this, is, uh, this one is from Hairline, but it's just a, uh, it's actually what they use in hospital too for cauterizing. Just run on AA batteries so you can replace them when they die. But it heats up, it glows nice and red. And all you gotta do, I like it for cleaning around the eyes or cleaning any stray fibers. You can just touch it and it will burn everything away. About the only downside to it is on these lighter colors, when you burn it, it kind of darkens the material a little bit. But it does a pretty good job of, and even shaping, you can shape with it, which is kind of nice. So once you think you're, you're pretty happy with it, so up on top here, I like a little bit of a little bit of this wool to stay a little bit longer right in the middle on top just because that makes that nice slick right into that rabbit fur and it holds a little bit of that profile. Every time I, I turn mine around I'm like now it's not done I gotta trim some more but eventually you just have to stop. This would be a good time if you got some head cement of some kind to go ahead and touch it. <laughs> All right, guys, that's that's the butt monkey. What'd you call me? <laughs> What'd you call me? What'd you say about my mom? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, it's a it's another great option. Like I find myself like I when I first learned to tie streamers, I kind of learned all of the classics as far as Kelly Gallup's concerned, um, even some of the other more popular guys. And then I kind of mix and match them all. So a lot of times I'll tie this head on other patterns that call for deer hair or vice versa. And it's nice to have just a diversity in your box. Just mess around with it. They've all kind of created their own patterns. This, I mean, some of them are tried and true, and this is a really good design one. But it's okay to mix and match, change things up, try different things. But it's a really good pattern to kind of mess around with. The rabbit strips, this is a really good idea for a lot of streamers you want to tie. Even if we ignored, so they, they do tie this fly with just one hook. So you could ignore this whole back piece, tie the fly like I showed it here. The only difference is that this rabbit zonker gets attached at the back and then again at the front. But otherwise it's the same. And you could tie a single hooked fly really quickly. And all it is is this head, this rabbit strips, and this underneath. So you could cut the time in half for if you want to tie a smaller version of it for, for trout. Not that a trout, a trout would definitely eat this size one, but if you want to tie a smaller one for a lake fishing or something, pretty simple to do. All right, guys. Any questions before we kind of close her down for the evening? Looks like everybody's combing and trimming away. <laughs> All right, well, I'll leave you guys at that. So I want to thank you guys again at home for tuning in. Uh, for you guys here, thanks again. We. We do really appreciate the support. Um, you know, me and Dana were talking just this last week and on the drive home in that nasty storm last week. Um, the, the what was it, three and a half hours home, long trip. It, we're just really, we're really appreciative of where this started and where we are now. You know, there's I think four people the first day, um, and now we're sitting at over 20 at most weeks. It's just we're thankful to have a community here of people that come out and support each other, su you know, support us, and, and we love to be here and doing this with you guys. Um, so keep coming, we, it's fun for us. We don't have a lot of weeks left before we shut down for the summer, but um, keep coming. We love to see your face every week and we'll keep going, okay? All right guys, again, thanks again from Fly Fishing Bull River. My name's Tim Hepworth. Stay tuned next week. We'll be tying another, um, another week of uh, mountain flies. Okay, have a good night, guys.
Um, www.fivepushingriver.com um, If you go under Thursday Night Live